Okay, welcome back to astronomy, and we're going to be talking about ancient astronomy. Our story begins with Pythagoras. Now, you know Pythagoras for the Pythagorean theorem. He also claimed that natural phenomena could be described with mathematics. He also believed that uh, circles and spheres were perfect forms in the universe, and he therefore suggested that the Earth should be a spherical in nature. The next person in our story is Aristotle. He asserted that the universe is governed by physical laws, also known as laws of physics. We'll be talking about Newton's laws of physics and Kepler's laws of physics a little bit later. He cited that uh, there was some convincing evidence that the Earth was spherical uh, by noticing that during a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the Earth um, appeared to be circular. Now you could argue that um, the earth is coin shaped, you know, back, back in the day, you could argue that if the earth was flat and coin shaped, it would also be circular. But regardless of where the eclipse occurred um, in the sky, the shadow of the earth was always circular, indicating that it must be spherical. Uh, this of course took lots of observations to be, uh, to have convinc convincing evidence of that. It's kind of interesting to note that during a lunar eclipse, you'll notice that uh, if you expose the film longer in this area, you can actually see the moon, although it's a bit red because the Earth's atmosphere is refracting uh, light around um, the Earth and also it's scattering out the blue, given only red light uh, that, you know, makes it or wraps it around uh, the Earth as it heads out toward the moon. The next person in our story is Eratosthenes, Eratosthenes rather. He was the chief libra librarian at Alexandria. And when he was reading some of the books in the library, he noticed that uh, there was a story about the uh, shadows in Syene some 500 miles away that on a certain day of the year, um, there was no shadows being cast by vertical sticks. So in Syene, on a particular day, there was no shadow, but on the same day in Alexandria, there was a substantial shadow. So he hired somebody to paste this off and did a little bit of the uh, trig and geometry to show that um, the uh, circumference of the Earth was around um, 40,000 kilometers, which was um, you know pretty accurate for someone who's just ha using sticks and and shadows. So he uh, made an accurate measurement of the diameter of the earth by measuring its circumference using those sticks and shadows in Alexandria and Syene. The next person in our story is Hipparchos. Uh, we have two contributions for uh, uh, Hipparchos in our ancient astronomy discussion. One is that he uh, demonstrated uh, this concept of parallax, a kind of a thought experiment that uh, if you have the sun at the center and um, the earth over here in one part of its orbit, that a nearby star would appear to be in front of these stars over here. Six months later, uh, the earth would be up here, a nearby star would be over here. Now, you notice that in this observation, um, the background stars are not moving and the nearby star is not moving but the earth is moving, but it looks like the nearby star is moving. So that's what he was referring to is this concept of parallax, not necessarily about the orbit of the earth and having it move, uh, having it be the apparent motion of a nearby star, but just parallax in general. So let's do a parallax demonstration with you in the room where you're at right now. So what I want you to do is close your right eye as it shows here on the diagram hold your thumb out in, in front of you and cover up a distant object, such as a light, a clock, a doorknob or something like that. And then uh, open your right eye and close your left eye. And so I want you to kind of go back and forth between viewing the room with your thumb in the foreground like this with uh, left eye and then right eye. And you'll notice that your thumb is jumping back and forth. Now, clearly your thumb is not moving. It's just an apparent motion of your thumb due to motion of the observer. And that's really what we're talking about here. Like this is your two eyes, there's your nearby thumb, and then here's the, the wall on which you're observing an object. So um, it might look something like this right here. You can hold your index finger, say in front of a sign with viewing only with your left eye, 
And then when you uh, close your left eye, open your right eye, but don't move your finger or your body, you'll notice that your, uh, this object, this uh, sign, would apparently move out from behind your finger. This concept of the apparent motion of an object due to motion of the observer is called parallax. So that's a really good demonstration of parallax. Hipparchos also introduced to us the idea of brightnesses of stars, apparent magnitudes. On the star chart, he's basically talking about the sizes of the dots. These are not really the sizes of stars, but uh, more accurately, the brightness of these brightnesses of these stars. So he came up with a measurement called the apparent magnitude system. That's what we call it today, at least. It's a measure of how bright a star looks in the sky. So it kind of doesn't take into account the distance or the temperature or the size of the star. It just says how much, you know, how bright does it appear to be? And the larger the number, uh, the dimmer of the stars to us in the sky. So it's kind of like, a, you know, first place. You would think that, you know, brighter stars would have like a higher number. And that's true if we're talking about the luminosity or, or the, the wattage that um, a star uh, radiates, the power that it radiates rather. Um, but he, this is kind of a backward scale. The lower the number, the brighter uh, the star. So it's a backward scale of brightness where one, uh, he said, is the brightest star in the sky and six is the faintest one you can see with your naked eye. We've rescaled them in modern times to be beyond the one through six. And obviously there are stars that are fainter than six magnitude. But we credit him with introducing this idea of apparent magnitude. It's talking about the brightnesses of stars, how bright they appear to be. The next part of our story in ancient astronomy deals with this concept of retrograde motion. Now I have an arrow over to the right hand side showing Jupiter pretty close to the ecliptic. And then I'm going to show an animation about what it would be like if we watch um, Mars go across the celestial sphere. And you notice that there is some parts of its uh, path across the celestial sphere in which it moves backwards. So most of the time we refer to this motion, um, this uh, eastward motion, because remember this is west and that's east. All right, so this eastward motion like this is direct motion. And then when it turns around and goes backwards for a short amount of time, we call that a retrograde motion. So it was kind of a mystery about why it would be that uh, planets, you know, they're going across the celestial sphere. Why would they decide to stop, back up, turn around, go the opposite direction? And then go back in this direction here. That was a mystery for a while. Um, why do planets have retrograde motion? Why do they exhibit that behavior? The sun and the moon don't do that. They go direct across the celestial sphere. But the planets have retrograde motion. What does it mean? Well, the next person in our story thought they had an answer to this, Ptolemy. He says, I think I have an idea about what this is caused by. So he attempted to explain retrograde motion with circles upon circles, a circle called a deferent and a circle called an epicycle. So a deferent is a circle. Um, so here's the earth right here. And we have an off-centered circle called a deferent right here. And then uh, we have another circle going around like this called an epicycle. So this is the geometric model that he used to, to try to explain why planets are moving backwards. Let's see if I can put it in a better context. You might've played around with this um, device called a spirograph in which you have a small gear inside of a bigger gear. It's kind of like a big deferent gear and a smaller epicycle gear. Uh, let me show you one more picture that might make it uh, be more sense here, make it ha uh, be a little bit more sensible. So here's our deferent and this circle right here circles around this one right here. So its center moves around the deferent. So if we follow the path of the planet in his model, it goes direct motion and then retrograde, and then direct motion and then retrograde. And his model did accurately predict when retrograde motion was going to happen. And his model worked for a long period of time. It turns out just not to be correct. I mean, objects don't orbit the earth as we know. Um, but it did work as far as, uh, you know, the epicycle and deferent of Venus predicting when Venus was going to go into retrograde as well as all these outer planets as well. So this leads us to the birth of modern astronomy because we're going to figure out what the real reason is 
for retrograde motion. Um, the, the person we credit with leading us in the right direction was uh, Copernicus, who developed a mathematical model for the heliocentric or sun-centered model of the solar system. And he proposed that retrograde was actually a result of parallax, that planets weren't really moving backwards. It just looked like they were because we were moving. So you can see in his textbook here, or not his textbook, his, his, um, his book that he wrote about this idea that uh, I think I have it, I have a better picture somewhere. Well, I guess we'll just stop right there and come back to this one. So here is the sun and then um, we have the planets moving around um, the sun instead. Now he still needed epicycles, but um, we'll get to that part later on. Uh, but it did explain why planets were apparently moving backwards. Here's the direct motion. And when the earth starts to overtake um, Mars, for example, it makes it look like Mars is going backwards. Now, if you've seen that happen before on the highway, uh, especially if you're not paying too much attention to the roadway and you're looking more at the adjacent car, which you might notice, especially if, it are, if you're at a stop sign, if this purple car starts to move forward a little bit, or that SUV rather, if it starts to move forward, it feels like you're moving backwards. So it's kind of an apparent motion. It looks like that. And so um, it turns out that that's why parent planets move backwards or apparently move backwards in their position around the celestial sphere. And that's because of parallax, the apparent motion of a body due to motion of the observer, us on the earth. And so here's a view from your textbook, a figure from your textbook that shows the really slow motion of an outer planet and then the earth overtaking it, making it look like a planet moves backwards and then back to going forward again. Now, Galileo played the role in determining who was correct. Was it Ptolemy with his deference and epicycles or was it uh, Copernicus with his um, heliocentric model of the universe? So you can see his telescope down here. He was among the first to turn a telescope toward the sky. I'm sure other people were looking at terrestrial objects, but he was among the first to make observations of what he saw. So some of the things were somewhat controversial for him to write down and, and, and uh, publish. Um, one of them was the observations of moons around Jupiter and the phases of Venus, both of which seem to suggest that the sun rather than the earth is at the center of the universe. Let's look at a few of his observations. Here are some of his drawings of uh, the moon. And he noticed, uh, this kind of got him into trouble also that, uh, you know, the, the earth, um, I'm sorry, the, the moon was of the celestial realm. It was in the sky. And it was supposed to be perfect, but it appeared from his sketches and drawings that it had earth-like uh, uh, features, mountains, valleys. And so how could that be that something Earth-like is actually in the celestial, celestial realm? Uh, so believe it or not, that, that observation alone kind of got him into a little bit of trouble there. Another observation is he found that there were some objects that were moving around Jupiter. So here is his sketches from 1610, and he saw small objects moving around Jupiter day to day. These today, we refer to them as the uh, Galilean satellites. This is uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, named after, uh, well, uh, we call them the Galilean satellites because these are the four uh, moons that he was able to observe. So this is a clear example of four objects that did not orbit the Earth. And so that was kind of controversial to have things that were not going around us in our egocentric or geocentric view of the universe. So if Aristotle was wrong about the Earth being at the center, could he also be wrong in other areas? That was the question that Galileo posed. Another observation that uh, began to suggest that uh, Copernicus rather than Tycho, uh, I mean uh, Ptolemy was correct, was that he observed uh, phases for Venus. So not only did, can you observe phases for the moon with your naked eye, but with a telescope, you get a crescent and then um, half and then give us an almost full phase for Venus. He also noticed that the size of Venus changed as it went through the phases, which means it was probably closer here and further away there. So 
it turns out that um, the full range of phases from crescent to full and even new is not really possible if there's a uh, if you have a geocentric model. Let me see if I can explain. Um, well, I think it's going to be on the next slide. Here's the crescent uh, Venus and then the crescent moon. You can see them in the daytime sometimes with a telescope. In the uh, part A over here, I have the uh, geocentric view. So the Earth is here and there's my epicycle and there's my deferent and the sun is out beyond Venus in this model. And you see, I got a new phase, a new phase and a crescent phase. So there's not, it's not really possible to have a gibbous phase for a uh, geocentric model. On the other hand, if I put the Earth out here and now I have Venus going around the sun, I get new, crescent, half, gibbous, and full. So I can get the full range of phases if I realize or propose that the sun is at the center of the universe. And so here's a graphic from your text showing the crescent and uh, gibbous phases of Venus. So this seemed to suggest to most people that uh, Ptolemy was not correct and that Copernicus was. So in summary, we've talked about Hipparchus developed a, developing a uh, apparent magnitude scale for the brightnesses of stars, uh, pretty much a reverse um, numerical scale, um, backward scale. So the lower the number, the brighter the, the star. Epicycles were used to explain retrograde motion in Ptolemy's model. Parallax is the apparent change of, of position of an object due to motion of the observer. Precession is the slow wobble of Earth's orbit. And retrograde motion is the apparent westward motion of planets as they move across the celestial sphere. All right, see you next time.